Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kerry Vaughn, as was mentioned earlier. I'm the Managing Director of Effective Altruism Ventures, the Managing Director of Effective Altruism Global, I'm the Director of the Effective Altruism Outreach Project for Center for Effective Altruism. So, lots of effective altruism in my life. And I want to talk about four things. I want to talk about what's effective altruism, what's the history of effective altruism, what isn't effective altruism, and then how can we succeed in the global. So first, what's effective altruism? Uh, we've got a quote here, which I quite like. Uh, effective altruism is a growing social movement founded on the desire to make the world as good a place as it can be, use of evidence and reason to find out how to do so, and the audacity to actually try. And that comes courtesy of the Center for Effective Altruism, where I work, so kind of partial to that definition. A different way of thinking about it. Effective altruism, efforts that actually help people rather than making you feel good or helping you show off, is one of the great new ideas of the 21st century. Also sounds cool. That comes to you courtesy of Stephen fucking Pinker, <laughs> one of the sort of best known academics in the world. Um, and by the way, he's like not, he's not like super uh, involved in the EA movement. He's just kind of been observing what's going on and he thinks it's one of the best new ideas. Uh, I think if you kind of boil it down though, effective altruism involves two steps. One, figure out how to do the most good. Two, actually go do it. Um, and while those steps are simple, they're not easy. So let's talk a little bit more about how that works. So first, figure out how to do the most good. Um, here I think there's sort of two steps, or two sort of tips. The first is be skeptical, and then the second is change your mind. So first, let's talk about being skeptical. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a story. Some of you may have heard this story before. Uh, what you have here is a play pump. And the way the play pump works is kids spin it like a merry-go-round, and it turns a crank, which produces water for a village. So a problem in rural Africa is people need water. Um, they usually have to walk a long distance to like a hand crank. They sort of crank it, do that for a while, and eventually, you know, they get some water for the village. Um, this is kind of tiring. They have to walk a long distance to do it. Um, you know, in some places you're lucky enough to have like a solar-powered water pump. And there, you know, that works great unless it's a still day and then you have to sort of wait around and hope that the wind picks up so you get some water. So somebody saw this and thought, there's got to be a better way. And so they wanted to use the renewable energy of children playing to produce the water instead. So, uh, you know, kids spin the thing, you get water, the women don't have to walk a long distance and crank the pump, seems great. Um, and the fact that this came out was kind of revolutionary. Uh, the CEO of AOL, Steve Case, put a bunch of money into this. Uh, Hollywood celebrities were behind it. They built thousands of pumps around Africa and everything looked good. Uh, there's one problem. Play pump doesn't work. It doesn't work in two ways. So first, uh, it's a terrible toy. So the reason America round is fun is because you spin it and then it has low friction and it keeps spinning. And that's what's fun about it. You get to get on and it keeps spinning. This has to have friction in order to produce the water. So it spins for a little while and then it stops. And then spins for a little while and then it stops. Turns out that's a really boring toy. So children didn't actually want to play with it. And then as a water uh, production system, it was just way worse than the hand crank. So first of all, spinning this is like a little bit demeaning. Like if you're trying to produce water and you're women in a village, like sitting here spinning this toy around is like kind of un uncool and it's not very efficient. Um, and then also a journalist calculated that to use a play pump to get as much water as you need for a typical village, you need to spend it for 27 hours a day. So it's actually impossible. Um, so the moral of the story is things that look good often aren't. You have to go find the evidence, figure out whether the thing actually works, be critical and think about, you know, whether, this, whether the evidence is here to support it. So this looks like a good idea, turns out it doesn't work. So that means we have to be skeptical. The second is change your mind. Um, so this is something Ruby already talked about a bit, so I don't want to go uh, too much deeper into it. Um, but one of the things I really love about the effective altruism community is that the kind of social currency of EA is in being willing to change your mind. So the way you kind of score social points here is uh, somebody gives you new evidence, and you go, yeah, that updates my beliefs. I've now changed the thinking this. And so um, hopefully you get an opportunity to do that with other people here and sort of practice the skill of changing your mind and sort of looking for ways that uh, your beliefs are, are wrong or can be changed. So remember, figure out how to do the most good and then do it. Let's talk about actually doing it. Um, and here I have another story. Um, so let's imagine you're at a dinner party and somebody spills a glass of water. Uh, what happens usually, if you're at a good dinner party, is everybody just kind of springs into action. You know, people move the plates out of the way, get the electronics out of the way, somebody springs up to go get you know, napkins to clean it up and then hands them out. And just kind of like everybody sees that there's a problem and just moves into it immediately. Um, what doesn't happen is people don't say, well, you know, you spilled it and I was kind of far away from the spill, so like you're in charge of that, and you know, 
Like Tom's good at nap napkin acquisition and distribution, so maybe Tom said go get the napkins. You just figure out what needs to be done and you go do it. And so my hope for effective altruism is that we build a community like that. So we build a community where we spend a ton of time figuring out how to do the most good and what's worth doing. And then when we see the problems, we just go solve them. We don't worry about whether we're moral, you know, whether we have a moral obligation to do it. We just see a problem and want to go solve it. Cool. Uh, so next, I want to talk about the history of effective altruism. And there's kind of three, uh, know, three strands to the history as I see it. So first is the work of moral philosophers like Peter Singer. Um, so Peter Singer has argued that on utilitarian grounds, you have a strong obligation to help the global poor. You have a strong obligation to not increase the suffering of factory farmed animals. Um, and a lot of people kind of thought that argument seemed right. And they thought, you know, instead of sitting in my lecture theater at my university nodding in agreement, I should actually do something about this. And that allowed a lot of people to get involved in effective altruism, where it's a community where you can actually do something about sort of strong arguments that you have a moral obligation to improve the world. Um, another big sort of piece of the effective altruism history is GiveWell. So this is Holden Karnowski and Ellie Hassenbelt. They're the founders of GiveWell. Um, they were working in a hedge fund. And as hedge fund people often do, they were making a ton of money. And they wanted to give some of that away to uh, somewhere that could do some good. And they thought, well, you know, if I'm going to give money away, I want to like, get a good you know, world improvement return on my investment, just like I'm getting a good investment return as a hedge fund manager. And uh, so they thought, we're probably not the first people to ask that question. Can we go figure out where's a good place to donate? So they looked online and found mostly nothing. You know, they looked at Charity Navigator and GuideStar and the sort of usual places and didn't have the information they were looking for. So then they started contacting charities directly. They started asking really basic questions. So they would ask, what do you do? How do you know it works? If I give you some money, what do you actually do with it? Um, and they couldn't find the information they were looking for there either. Um, in fact, kind of famously, they asked a charity this sort of, you know, these sort of basic questions, and that charity called Bridgewater back where they worked and tried to get them fired because they assumed that they had to be a spy for another charity trying to figure out their sort of trade secrets. Um, so they're like, okay, so this evidence just isn't out there. And it seems like other people would be asking this question, what can I do with some money to improve the world? So they thought, we'll just go answer it instead. So they found a GiveWell to help answer that question. Then a third sort of uh, strain of the history is the rationalist movement. Um, which you know the Center for Effective, sorry, the Center for Applied Rationality is a part of, the Less Wrong community is a part of, um, and this community sort of noticed through work um, of Kahneman and others that people have all these weird biases, like things that don't seem like they should affect our decisions often do. Um, the way you frame things, the way you order decisions, all of this can make people choose things drastically differently, um, and this seemed like a problem. So they wanted to help uh, improve people's rationality. Um, one thing about that is this can be used for anything. You can use rationality to do good or to do evil. But a lot of them found out that what they wanted to use rationality to do is improve the world. And so that kind of emphasis on how can we improve our rationality and use that for world improvement is another big part of the history of effective altruism. Next, let's talk about the history of EA Global, so the history of this conference. Um, EA Global started two years ago in a house in Berkeley. It was literally 60 people, single house. They slept on like blow up mattresses on the floor, um, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was an interesting experience. And this picture here is a picture of one of the talks given by Peter Thiel, and like most of the people who were at the first year's uh, EA Global were in this room. Um, so that's year one. Year two, uh, we held it in Berkeley, and there was about 180 people that attended. And so this is a picture of everybody that was there. And then this year, we've got over 900 effective altruists gathering in three countries. This is a picture from the San Francisco event. This is less than half of the total people that are attending EA Global. Um, and sort of further on the history, this is a graph of search and interest and the term effective altruism over time. So as you can see, it's kind of nothing and then like, boom, exponential growth. And so that's kind of where EA's been heading, is it kind of came out of nowhere and it's growing uh, really rapidly and it's becoming a very strong movement. So next, let's talk about what effective altruism isn't. Um, and I've got kind of three things. Uh, so the first is effective altruism isn't just about money. So a lot of people think effective altruism is just about donating to good charities, or it's about earning to give, so taking a job that pays as much as possible and then donating as much of that as you can. And while this is part of effective altruism, it's not the only thing. Um, lots of effective altruists work directly in charities. Um, some build up skills that are useful, like they work in politics or they work in consulting. So they can build up generally useful skills that can be deployed for improving the world later. 
So money is part of it, but it's not the only thing that effective altruism is about. Um, next, you might think effective altruism is about super rigorous RCT evidence for everything, like the highest scientific standards for every decision we make. Um, and in global health, this is kind of true, so we can get really high quality evidence, and we often demand that. But it's not the only thing that effective altruism is about. Um, often ways to improve the world is to look for causes that don't have super rigorous evidence, but where the arguments for thinking that it's likely to work are really strong. Um, so an example of this is working on preventing existential risk. You're not going to have an RCT that shows that you know, your particular intervention is going to work, but you can run like a philosophical argument that shows that the impact might be quite high. The third thing that effective altruism isn't is it's not just global poverty plus animal welfare plus existential risk equals effective altruism. Um, to be sure, those are part of the picture of effective altruism. People work on all of those things. There's tons of other things that effective altruists can and do work on. They might work on politics. They might work on movement building, which is what I work on. Uh, they might work on criminal justice reform or uh, macroeconomic policy. They might work on improving science or ending aging or prolonging life or immigration reform. So there's tons of areas that EAs can work on. Um, since we're looking for what can do the most good, we shouldn't be committed to the things that we kind of started out working on. We should be constantly looking for new areas to explore and for new ways to make a difference. And then finally, how to succeed at EA Global. We've got two tips. The first is get help. The second is radical life change. So first, I'm getting help. Um, I think it's pretty plausible that people in this room, or that this room generally, is the best room in the entire world if you want to improve the world. Like, this is the best room for you to be in. If you sort of look around, there are people who can help you co-found projects. There are people who might want to donate to a project that you're working on. There are people who have new insights into you know, projects that are working or things that can improve the world. So uh, my first big tip for how to succeed at VA Global is to take advantage of that. Um, this is like a really unique and rare opportunity. So make sure you make the most of it. And then second, my second tip is radical life change. Um, so I'm the managing director of EA Global. Uh, the reason I wanted to work on this project is because I attended the EA Summit last year, and it basically changed my life. So I was working at a foundation. I was kind of thinking about, you know, how can I use a bunch of money to improve the world? And I've been talking to some EAs, and they seem to have interesting ideas. So kind of on a whim, I went to the Effective Altruism Summit, and uh, just met so many amazing people who were passionate and dedicated and intelligent and really wanted to improve the world. I felt like I kind of arrived home and I kind of found my tribe. So I quit my job. I thought, I want, I want more of that, so I want to build the EA movement. And that's what I've been working on ever since. So my kind of hope for some of you in the audience is that uh, you have that kind of experience. That you find something that's a way better plan than what you're working on, that's way more fulfilling, and you get a chance to make a radical change. Um, and then my more general hope for effective altruism as a movement is that in 50 or 60 years, when I'm old and gray, and some of you are older and grayer, um, that people look back on this time, you know, early 2010, 2015, and they think, like, wow, that was the moment when humanity finally got its shit together and started to really try and build the kind of world that we actually want to live in. So my hope is that EA Global is kind of the first step on that more general journey, and that's the first step on your journey uh, to making a big difference. Thank you.